Hold the lift. Good evening, First Officer Keegan. How has this Emperor Blessed Day been for you? Nothing but barrels of sunshine and Amasek, dear sister. Deck 6. Sector 85, if you'd be so kind. I just got out of my daily briefing with our dear Captain. And the Commissar came up. She's not exactly happy. But what else is new? Captain Verletta? She seemed in good enough spirits last time I spoke with her. Spirits are the operative word. Huh? Don't worry about it. She definitely doesn't. That data pad is written in all capital letters. Is that the way you normally write memos? <sighs> no. Strange. At the end of the day, I prefer to write down what's said in the way it's said. And since I can't paint the words on the side of the ship, this is the best thing. Do you mean she yelled at you? <laughs> Something of an understatement. Yelling for her is somewhere between a whisper and writing a note for most people in terms of volume. Ever heard of the noise, Marines? Yes. Ah, you get it then. I'm on my way to see the Commissar. Is he in a good mood? I do believe so. He's... Not for long. Why? Captain Varletta has given me a message to relay. Primarily because she can't seem to remember how to use the Vox. I am to inform him of the captain's displeasure. Oh, First Officer, it certainly can't be as bad as all that. <laughs> you are the boil on the armpit of humanity. You are about as interesting to listen to as the last post binge. It's that bad. Thrilling, in fact. It's going to be great in my autobiography next to the four or five times a day I clean up her vomit from the chair she either sleeps, slumps, or gets sloshed in. Be nice if she did something commanding every once in a while, but beggars can't be choosers. I get the idea you don't like it on this ship, Commander Keegan. You're the first officer of a Dauntless-class destroyer. What can be so bad? Let's put it this way. I have dreams of herding cats. They are wonderful dreams. But I don't have someone who smells like a bum who got lost for five years in a liquor factory yelling in my face about things that are her fault. And I don't have random people showing up uninvited to, quote, visit the Commissar. Commissar, I demand... Oh, no. Hello, noble blood raven. Speak of the devil. <gasps> First Officer Keegan, is the reliquary locked? You're assuming we have anything worth stealing. You're not wrong. Excuse me, I think I'll just be going this way. Oh, my it? Glorious to see you, sister. You seem ill, noble Astartes. Why are you trembling? And where did you come from? I, well, you know, <coughs> I... Dust everywhere. Why am I in an elevator? Tell me, noble space marine, why does our lovely sister think you are a blood raven? You're not a blood raven? Dear sister, this is Arzik Araman. Are a what? Are a man? Run, it excites me. <laughs> that sounds like a you problem. I love my job. One unbreakable shield against the coming darkness. One last blade forged in defiance of fate. Let them be my legacy to the galaxy I conquered. And my final gift to the species I failed. It was said that the Thunder Warriors died in a glorious final battle. The last battle of the Unification Wars, charging the final enemy stronghold in a valorous and beautiful final act that cemented the rule of the Emperor beloved by all. The last Thunder Warrior alive, with his last breath, erected the banner of the lightning bolt at the top of the mountain. His duty done, and in death, the noble Thunder Warriors now rest.
It is a beautiful story about the final act of a breed of warriors that had won the Emperor Terra, and then firmly allowed humanity to take its first steps towards the stars in over 4,000 years. That story is a lie. A beautiful lie to cover a hideous truth. The truth is that all the Thunder Warriors who were left after the conquest of Terra were gathered for an assault on a hill that was barely worth defending. To the Thunder Warriors, it was to be a symbolic gesture, an easy victory, but a symbolic one. As they charged the hill, they were already cheering in victory. They never noticed that the Golden Warriors of the Custodes and the first few Astartes of what was become the Black Angels had completely surrounded the hilltop that they charged towards. As they mopped up the meager defenses and began to celebrate, the word was given. The Custodians and the Astartes turned their weapons on the Thunder Warriors and what followed was the complete culling of the entire strain of the Emperor's first Proto-Astartes. The Thunder Warriors were an unstable group, and like a baker throwing away a bad batch, the Emperor simply tossed them aside. The tool had been good enough for the job of conquering Terra, but now that tool was useless. Rather than trying to save those who had been the workhorse behind the Unification Wars, the Emperor chose to eliminate them, and then lionize them forever. The story of the last brave charge of the Thunder Warriors was told, and then repeated, and no one who was actually there ever spoke of it again. The few times one of the Thunder Warriors was actually sighted after escaping the genocide of their genetic strain, they would be instantly hunted down without pity or mercy, lest the truth of what actually happened be revealed. Secrets such as this, were they to be discovered in the early days of the Imperium, would have had instant and dangerous results. It is not a stretch in any way to say that certain Primarchs, upon finding out the truth of what happened to the first tools of conquest the Emperor had, would have instantly rebelled out of a sense of self-preservation. If the Emperor had ordered the eradication of those who had conquered Terra, what would stop him from doing it again? To any who would say the Emperor wouldn't have done this, we already have examples in the 2nd and 11th Legion. I say all of that to say this. When a secret needs to be kept, there is always one thing in common. There is always someone who must never find out what only a few actually know. With this in mind, I will now tackle one event that is always brought up when discussing mistakes that the Emperor made. It's one of the most memed about events that happened in the Heresy, and from the outside it causes the most confusion and downright bewilderment from most fans of the universe. But what if I told you that the single greatest mistake the Emperor was said to have made was never a mistake at all? What if I told you the truth? that if the wider Imperium ever learned of what the Emperor intended, the Imperium would have ceased to exist in its current form almost instantaneously. I'm speaking, of course, about the Human Webway Project, the single greatest gamble in humanity's history. For an unknown amount of time before the Emperor began even crafting the Primarchs, the Webway Project was front and center in his plans. In the grand scheme of things, the Webway Project was always the most important to the Emperor, greater than the Primarchs, greater even than the Imperium itself, just because of what the completion of the project would allow. For the Emperor, it started in the ruins of a city dating extremely far back into the Dark Age of Technology. Inside the ruins of this city that set in a desert in modern-day Asia was the first piece of technology he would soon modify to use in the Webway Project. The Golden Throne. When most people picture the throne in their mind, they picture the Emperor sitting on a literal golden chair. The truth of the matter is that the apparatus of the Golden Throne sits on top of a massive warp gate. In fact, the warp gate is so tall that a Warhound Titan could comfortably walk through it upright with no danger of clipping the sides or the top. The area in which the Golden Throne sits would again be the size of your average NFL stadium large enough to fit the entirety of the apparatus of both the Warp Gate itself and the Golden Throne, as well as at least six full companies of Space Marines and every bit of support gear they could possibly need, as well as vehicles. All of this was underground beneath the Imperial Palace. 
The planning and execution of the Webway project was carried out entirely in secret, and the only one who actually knew of it that was allowed to actually leave the project site was none other than Malkador the Sigilite. An entirely new order of the Mechanicus was created by the Emperor himself, named, quite poetically, the Uniters, who worked tirelessly on the project. As the Great Crusade expanded, part of the process was the search for more technology to be used in the development of the Golden Throne, leading to discoveries such as a less powerful version of the Golden Throne known as the Dark Glass. The Dark Glass apparatus was used as a testing board for all the technologies that would later be installed in the Golden Throne itself. Unable to duplicate the psychically neutral material that the webway was made of, the Emperor opted for a cruder but effective approach. The Unifiers would use warded materials to create the tunnel to bridge the Cradle of Humanity into the Webway. And by using the Golden Throne, it would only then take a powerful Psyker sitting on the Psychic Amplifier that was the throne itself to shore up the human-constructed tunnels. The Unifiers would simply then create their own branches into the existing Webway, effectively severing humanity's need for travel in the warp or at the very least massively curtailing it until replacing it altogether. I have been admittedly vague when discussing certain events in this lore series, but that has been for a reason. When looking at complex events in history or lore, it's critical to ensure they are viewed in their proper order and within the context of that order, or else meaning is completely lost. Take the rise of the Soviet Union, for example. Without the proper timeline in place as well as the context of the events, it can be almost mystifying how the Tsar lost complete power so quickly. What tends to happen with lore in the early Imperium is that people pick specific events without considering the wider context. Take the extermination of the Thunder Warriors. From the outside, without realizing the full context of what was actually happening, the Emperor simply sanctioned the genocide of the very soldiers who had won in Terra. Once you begin piecing the timeline together, however, the Thunder Warriors were rapidly becoming unstable, prone to murderous rages, and became as much of a threat to themselves as anyone else. In short, the prototype that was the Thunder Warriors was failing catastrophically, and changes needed to be made. The Emperor couldn't just simply retire the Thunder Warriors and let them loose in the general population, nor could he give any of them any other position. Their mental degradation was accelerating too fast. It was only a matter of time before the majority of the Thunder Warriors would have to be put down by force irregardless. The Emperor took the most pragmatic, if cold, approach possible given the circumstances dealt. It was this cold, pragmatic approach he used to deal with most matters. This is not a criticism of his character, this is basically what the character of the Emperor boils down to. Does the Emperor love humanity? The answer to that is simple. The Emperor does love humanity, more so than any being is seemingly capable of loving something else, but this love of humanity is just that, a love of humanity, and not a love of individual humans. As I've said before, the Emperor had seen generation after generation born, grow old, and die. Over 1,200 generations of humanity had come and gone while the Emperor lived at the start of the 30th millennia. It was because of this absolute detachment from the lives of mortals that brought on this cold pragmatism. In the Emperor's eyes, it simply didn't matter if entire civilizations were put to the sword and mass swaths of the population were made unhappy in the short term. In fact, it didn't even matter if entire planetary populations were wiped clean if it served the long-term goal of safeguarding humanity itself. It was because of this clinical approach that the Emperor made some of the decisions that he did. At one time, he might have come close to some sort of understanding with those around him, but those days were far over by the time the Emperor began to plan the Webway project. The Emperor had been close to a living god from the first time he could actually remember anything. He was older than civilization itself, and he had met no mental challenge he couldn't overcome with time. By the time the Unification Wars had kicked off, the Emperor had lost almost any ability to understand why humanity would ever turn to religion. 
something even the most arrogant atheist can actually understand. The problem, in the end, was that the Emperor was waging war for the very soul of humanity, a soul he barely understood. And he was fighting this war against four beings that understood humanity better than humanity will ever begin to understand itself. I haven't given you your proper blessing, noble space marine. Commissar, your friend Araman is here to... Well, apparently he's here to get brutalized by an angry sister of battle. I'll just be having a seat here. Why? Because I'm sitting down here. I'm not sitting up there. And in my position, I'm in need of some cheap entertainment. All right, but I'm doing a vox cast. Don't worry. I'll be quiet as a purple orc. I'm not saying it. Oh, come on. It'll be fun. No. Spoil sport. So let's actually answer the one question, the most asked question, when dealing with anything the Emperor did wrong. Why did the Emperor not tell his sons, not even Horus or Magnus, about the Webway Project? The answer to this comes from the one thing the Emperor actually did understand better than anything else. Power. In the fledgling Imperium, there was a single organization that held absolutely no military might. Any economic strength was utterly meaningless, and it had next to no political aspirations. It was, in every single way, an organization that could have been dismissed as defunct and meaningless except for one simple thing. In the United States alone, there are over 2 million semi-trucks in operation, all driven an average of 45,000 miles, or over 72,000 kilometers per year. 68% of all goods are transported by truck, and if you were to average out the weight of goods delivered, it would average out to over 60,000 pounds for every American alive. If, for any reason, the truck stopped moving, it would only take a day for hospitals to run out of basic supplies and the mail service would shut down nationwide. Fuel shortages would begin to immediately appear. Manufacturers that operate with an adjust-on-time model would begin to fail. Within three days, almost every major city would begin to experience food shortages. Banks wouldn't be able to process transactions. Within only two weeks, the clean water supply in most cities would be completely gone. These timetables do not take into account population panic in the face of whatever event led to this. Most cities, bereft of the constant supply, would devolve into absolute anarchy within days. Violence would be the order of the day over basic food items that cost less than a dollar, and water would be worth its weight in gold. Now take what I just said. Instead of 68% of all goods being delivered by the same trucks, make it 100. Now take every truck driver in the United States and organize them into several tight, cohesive groups, like a family. Now take all of those truck drivers and give them a singular, unique trait that only they will have, and this is the very thing that allows them to drive those trucks in the first place. No one else can learn how to drive the trucks. You are either born with a trait to drive those trucks, or you are not. And if your family should ever decide that they want to prove a point, you simply sit in the driver's seat and go nowhere. Now you can begin to see and have a rough idea of the pure and unadulterated power of one small group within the Imperium called the Navigators, and their houses, the Navis Nobilite. The Navigators were the only ones possessed with the capability to guide ships through the hellish landscape known as the Warp, possessing a third eye that could see into the Immaterium and safely pilot through. Without the Navigators willingly taking the ships of the Imperium through the Warp, the Imperium would literally vanish in a solar week as entire sectors unraveled. And the biggest problem is, they know it and always have. If an organization possesses the only means to keep yourself and your family alive, and they offer even a harsh price, you will pay it and gladly. The Navis Nobilite, even though hated for being psychers and feared for their mutation, were at a point beyond essential to the Imperium, beyond vital. With nothing more than a few well-paid bodyguards, and with the fee they charged, 
the Nobelite were a non-factor in political, economic, and military affairs. But in reality, they held more power than the Emperor himself. The Emperor could dream of a galaxy-spanning Imperium all day, every day, for a hundred thousand years. But without the Navigator Houses, it would only ever be just that. A dream. Another organization within the Imperium would be the Astropaths. Psychers who project their minds across time and space. But they are actively suppressed, mainly because there are so many of them that could be used. But they also have the ability to read the thoughts of those around them, and would often do so almost accidentally. While the Navigators may or may not have been able to read the thoughts of those around them, the standard run-of-the-mill astropath most definitely could. And should even one of them have discovered what the Emperor was doing beneath the Imperial Palace, the entire of the Navis Nobilite would know within the week, and all it would take was one stray thought. One unguarded side note in a single mind. This is why the Emperor didn't tell Horus, or Magnus, or any of the rest of his sons about the Webway Project. He understood power, and he understood what others would do to protect that power. The Webway Project wouldn't just be a side note of interest to the Astropaths and the Navigators. It would be an extinction-level threat that would demand an immediate and drastic response. The Webway Project would strip the power of the Navigator Houses away within the first instant of the first warp gate being activated, and what power the Astropaths had as well, leaving both organizations at best sundered, at worst at threat of extinction. The Navigators would instantly parallel themselves to other abhuman or mutant populations that had existed within the Imperium, and what had happened to them the moment that their usefulness had run out. The Thunder Warriors who won Terra, extinct. The Selenar who had mass-produced the Astartes, all but extinct. The Astropaths themselves were brutally conditioned to prevent the danger of one of them turning rogue. With the possibility of being rendered completely obsolete at worst, or having their power halved at best, the Navigators would have only one choice in front of them. The rebellion of the Navis Nobilite would be the most bloodless from a combative stance in history. They would simply do nothing. The Emperor, if he wanted to save his Imperium, would have no choice but to meet the demands of the very thing that currently held his Empire together. And when I say the Emperor would not have a choice, I mean exactly that. Unlike any other organization that existed, there was simply no backup plan or fallback in the case the Navis Nobilite stopped working with the Imperium. And again, the Navis Nobilite knew this very well. Of course, the Emperor could put their lives under threat, but the chances of that working are very slim to non-existent. An individual navigator might cave, but not the majority, and based off the earlier treatment of abhumans whose usefulness had run its course, the navigator houses would not be swayed on this. It is the very definition of a no-win scenario for the Emperor. Keep it secret from everyone, or risk the project becoming known to the very people who you are attempting to supplant in power. Killing them is not an option if they rebel. Threatening them is pointless, because if you get what you want, they will probably just die anyway. At the point the Navis Nobilite finds out about the Webway Project, and it becomes a serious threat, the organization would throw the only card that it had to play. Sit down and do nothing. And it would have worked, because the second the Nobilite refused to guide the Imperium ships, the Imperium would have a month of continued existence at best. It's clear that the Navis knew that the Emperor was attempting to do something to ease the reliance of the Imperium on them. They had attempted to destroy the technological artifact known as the Dark Glass, but while they might have had their suspicions, they did not have rock-solid proof, and they certainly didn't know how close the Emperor was to completing his project. Even though they were feared, even though they were hated, the Rebellion would have been a public affair. This is why none of his sons knew, not because he didn't trust them completely. It was because he knew the risk. 
It was a risk not only that the Navis Noblite would find out, but that the Imperium would see the true power behind the throne. It was not the Space Marine Legions, nor the massed might of the Imperial Navy and Army. It was in a small group of mistrusted and hated abhumans. If the Navis Noblite had discovered how close the Emperor was to cutting off humanity's need for the war, and had staged a rebellion, there was very little that could have been done about it, but the consequences would have been staggering. The Emperor's image would have taken a very serious and public blow that could have proven disastrous for his leadership of the Imperium. Even the betrayal of Horus would have paled in comparison, for while one was against a powerful military target that was bent on the Emperor's death, the very war which turned him into a messianic figure, the other would have destroyed the image of absolute power that the Emperor possessed. The Navis Nobili, in playing their only card, would have been fully capable of increasing their own power and influence titanically. In fact, the only reason they don't do so now and did not do so then was because, strangely enough, of their public image. They are hated and feared, but they are content to be left alone and sell their abilities to the Imperium for a fee. However, if they were placed under threat of extinction, which the Webway Project was an existential threat, they would be justified in reacting regardless of how anyone felt. There would be no Imperial cult as a result. There would be no God Emperor of Mankind. Good morning, evening, or night to all the wonderful citizens of the Imperium across this vast and expansive galaxy that we have the privilege to guide your ships through. I am Hector Belisarius, leader of the Belisarius House of Navigators, of the Navis Nobility, and I would just like to assure the public at large that we would never ever take our power into our own hands like that. This commissar is just speaking your typical anti psycho nonsense. The Navigator houses would never, ever stop bringing food and water to all those billions of very hungry and very thirsty citizens of this glorious Imperium if the correct fees weren't paid. And you didn't give us the respect we deserve. No, no, no. As far as us having more power during the Great Crusade than even our glorious God Emperor. Pure lies, my friends. Pure lies. We are but simple people who enjoy plying our gift for the betterment of all mankind and will continue to do so forever and ever. And don't you ever forget it. One Primarch did find out about the Webway Project on his own, or at least he had an educated guess. I covered the destruction that Magnus had caused in my last Voxcast on this subject, but what I did not cover was the effect it had on the Emperor himself, besides his confinement to the Golden Throne. When I talk about how the Emperor both viewed and used his sons as tools, there are some that critique my reasoning. Often it is cited how the Emperor behaved in the later stages of the Crusade. He was sentimental, and he was often portrayed as downright merciful and loving. How can a man who viewed his creations as tools be at the same time the same emperor that began expressing such hopeful pining that his son would return to his side? Alright, who's calling me on the Vox? Commissar! First Officer Keegan? Could you come down to the 12th cargo hold, please? Does this concern the space- What do you think it concerns, Commissar? Very well, I'll be down in a bit. I've said this in a previous Voxcast, but it's appropriate here, so I'm going to repeat myself. It is said that when you make a profound mistake, or in this case mistakes, there is a moment of clarity that roots you into the place in which you stand, a moment that shocks you to your very core. In that moment, you understand that you have erred, and now you will be made to pay for your mistakes. 
The Emperor had watched as Magnus brought everything he had been working for for millennia crashing down in his face, and was now, for lack of a better term, imprisoned on the Golden Throne without any hope of escaping. For months he hadn't slept or even rested, his entire will bent toward holding back the tides of demons that could spill through if he stopped for even a moment. It was painful, agonizing even, enough to elicit screams of pain at times from the master of mankind. Why does this hold any relevance? It is only when we as humans are dragged down that we gain any real perspective. It's only when we fail and can't fix what has been done that we experience true regret. Regret is as powerful as a prison, and at that moment the Emperor was facing his prison, an eternity of pain and hardship, just to keep the species that he loved alive. One thing that is not shown is the immediate aftermath of Magnus destroying the Webway Project, and the importance of those five minutes cannot be overstated. I can only imagine the thoughts that race in the Emperor's mind. The sudden realization of what had been done and what he must now do. I can only imagine the first waves of pain, the way his fingertips would have gripped the sides of the Golden Throne, the first true grimace of concentration. Envision it yourself. See the arcs of electricity flaying around the workings of the Golden Throne, shouts of the Unifiers and the other mortals who are working on the project trying to find something anything that would in any way salvage the damage that had been done. For only a moment, I can imagine the Emperor as he felt the full weight of the war pressing against his mind, opening his eyes. I can imagine the looks he gives easily because I've seen similar expressions before. Someone in pain, who doesn't think they will ever recover, who is suddenly and brutally coming to the realization that somewhere, somehow, Things have gone horribly wrong, and there is absolutely nothing that can be done to fix it. Then, in the back of his eyes, as he looks at the ruin of his entire dream, I imagine I would see the first flicker of true regret as well as bitterness. And speaking of bitterness... Commissar, I put up with a lot on this ship, and I don't ask a lot. Do I? No, you don't. What's that sound? Do I instantly call the Inquisition the second I hear you're playing Battle Mace 40 million with Perturabo? No. Do I lock down the entire ship when random traitor Astartes just pop in at random? Or report you when you basically call into question the actions of the Emperor? No, where are you going with this? I put up with a lot on this ship, cleaning after you and the lush on the bridge, but I really need you to explain this one. Why is there a space wall chained to the wall in the cargo hold? Okay, seriously, what is that? Dog toy. What? Never mind all that. Can you explain why he's here now? That's Uther Weirdmake. And that name means what to me? Okay, so basically he's from the 30th millennium, and he was one of the first to insist that all the space wolves' rune priests aren't psychers. He backstabbed the Thousand Sons, and he was a general douchebag, and I hate him. So, I summoned Araman of the Thousand Suns using a binding and forced him to summon Weirdmake from the Immaterium, which apparently is hard because his soul was devoured. Um, basically, he had to reconstruct Weirdmake from demon shit. So, anyhow, I forced Araman to summon him here so I could tell him to his face that I hate him and he's an asshole. Wow. You just said that so casually. Do you even have a grasp of how much was wrong with that statement? Basically. Okay, seriously, he's way too happy right now and I can't stand it. I'm leaving. I'll be back later. Well, what do you want me to do with him then? Um, how about you feed and water him and then take him for a walk? Very funny. I've often stated in this series that the Emperor fell victim to impatience, hubris, and a general inability to understand those around him. In no way are the last two more clear than in his final dealings with Magnus the Red. I have said often that the Emperor viewed his sons as nothing more than tools, with some being favored more than others. In this instant, the truth of this statement comes to light. The Emperor, even though he communicated psychically with Horus multiple times, did not try to redeem Horus or try to bring him back into the fold. 
In no way did the Emperor even attempt communications with Perturabo, Angron, Lorgar, Mortarian, or Fulgrim. But Magnus? The Emperor did everything he knew how to bring Magnus back, the reason being simple. Of all of his sons, Magnus was the one and the only one who, at any point, could have salvaged everything that had been done to the Webway, and thereby, the Imperium. The Emperor laid out a path only someone such as Magnus could actually see, and guided him unwittingly into the throne room of the Imperium, revealing himself to his son psychically at first, speaking to Magnus in the only way he really still could. Up until this point, Magnus did not understand the full effect of what he had done by breaching the webway. He did not know how close he had come to destroying Terra in its entirety. The Emperor told Magnus that he had been warned about experimenting with the warp, but admitted his own fault in not telling Magnus why. Magnus was told to his face that the Emperor knew there were places that should not be gone to and lines never to be crossed, and had warned Magnus about it and all that warning should have been enough. Even when literally negotiating for the life of the Imperium and himself, the Emperor could not empathize with his son, his most inquisitive son, on whose shoulders the Emperor could have placed the future of the Imperium. Magnus destroyed the psychic projection of his father and ascended the Golden Throne, and was prepared to kill the Emperor. At this point, there was no one to stop him, and Magnus's spear was prepared to simply stab forward. He, more so than Horus ever was, was in a position to kill the Emperor as he sat unable to defend himself on the Golden Throne. At the last moment, Magnus broke, unable to kill his father, pain and regret overcoming the desire to kill his creator. The only guardian of the Emperor able to stop Magnus, Vulcan, was too far away to have stopped Magnus from executing the Emperor, but that moment gave him the time to get to the Emperor's side. The reunion of Magnus and Vulcan is a tearjerker to be honest. Magnus doesn't know how to even approach Vulcan, believing the Primarch or the Salamanders could only see him as a monster. Now give me a hug! No, no, keep back! I have no idea why you're so friendly given everything that's happened, but this is obviously a ruse! I got nothing but friendliness for you because you are my big friendly big brother friend! But come on guys, it's Vulcan. Vulcan loved his brothers. And as they spoke, Magnus' resolve slowly faded. The Emperor then communicated again with Magnus psychically. It was in this psychic communication the Emperor made Magnus an offer that simply no other Primarch had received. Forgiveness. The Emperor showed Magnus the history of humanity, the growth and collapse of civilizations, the growth of industry, warfare, and time and time again how humanity had almost destroyed itself. Magnus witnessed firsthand the first age of space exploration, the expansion of humanity to its first golden age. Then he saw Old Knight, the rise of the Techno Barbarians, and finally he saw the rise of his father. He saw the Imperium form, the expeditionary fleets launched before he had even been found. Magnus waited for everything to go wrong as it was currently going wrong, but it didn't. He watched as Horus led the crusade to the edge of the galaxy, raising the banner of humanity on the last world to be conquered. He saw his homeworld of Prospero, new cities that in his mind could have only been built by the mind of Perturabo. He was then shown himself sitting on the golden throne of Terra, serene and calm. Magnus asked his father why he was being shown this, that the future was destroyed in this vision to which the Emperor only told him that not all futures were gone. The Emperor offered him complete forgiveness and a place back at his side, and even more. Magnus was offered command of an entirely new legion. A legion that was free from the taint of the flesh change, the very thing that had almost destroyed the Thousand Suns in the first place, and the very thing that caused Magnus to make the deals with Zinch that he had made. For Magnus, this was almost too good to be true, but at the end of the day, there is one constant in every true mistake made by the Emperor. 
a lack of understanding. And all of this falls on the Emperor's shoulders because at this point, he should have known better. Magnus asked a simple question. What of my sons? What of those thousand sons who remained alive? The Emperor told him that they were beyond saving and they would have to be purged. The Emperor, who knew Magnus had sacrificed and eventually turned to Horus to save his sons, had just asked Magnus to betray the ones that were left alive. The Emperor had just made Magnus an offer that he could never accept. This mistake, in the end, makes almost all others pale into insignificance, because Magnus was fully on board, and in reality the remaining thousand sons, while tainted, could have been useful to the goals of the Emperor. While the story of Angron has the most clear signs of the Emperor being oblivious to the basic drives of others, this part simply drives that point home a thousandfold. The horrible thing was it was simply too easy to avoid, and at any point the Emperor could have asked Vulcan or even Dorn if Magnus would have accepted that price, and both would have told him it would be too much. The Emperor, if he had actually taken a moment to consider his stance and seek outside opinion, would have turned Magnus back to his side. He would have secured the Webway Project and the future of humanity, and Magnus would have probably accepted the sequestering of his sons if it meant keeping them alive. Magnus himself would have returned to the Imperium at the head of a new legion that was as psychically gifted as a thousand sons, but without the dangers of the flesh change. But instead, the Emperor asked Magnus to do the very thing which would drive the final nail in the coffin. The Emperor asked Magnus to kill and betray his own sons, two of which were, at that very moment, fighting to protect Magnus as he spoke with the Emperor. Stupid! You're so stupid! Magnus turned to Vulcan, motioning to two of Vulcan's salamanders and asked if Vulcan would ever sacrifice his own sons. Vulcan, being of the same mindset as Magnus, told him no. It was at that point that Magnus tried to kill the Emperor again, only being stopped by Vulcan himself while the Emperor sat motionless and helpless on the Golden Throne. As the fight continued and the numbers turned squarely against him, Magnus finally turned fully to Zinch, embracing the Chaos God's offer of demonhood. Whisked away by the very power that was currently keeping out the other demon Primarchs, Magnus left the Emperor sitting on the Golden Throne. What could have been the single event to save the Imperium had sealed its fate, and it had all come down to the Emperor making a demand. A demand he didn't understand the consequences of. Rogel Dorn would have known perfectly well that Magnus would not betray his sons. Lehman Russ could have told the Emperor the same thing and Vulcan was preparing to defend the Emperor even as Magnus asked him if Vulcan would be willing to betray his sons. Any one of them could have told the Master of Mankind the truth and would have done it gladly, but it's not clear if they were even asked, and even if they were, it's clear that their words were not heeded. It would be easy to chalk this up to a writer putting themselves into a corner and needing something to get them out, but this is the Emperor of Mankind's character that we have witnessed on multiple occasions. The Emperor had sacrificed his sons. He had sacrificed the Thunder Warriors. He had sacrificed billions if not trillions of lives, including two Primarchs, three if you include Angron, in the pursuit of his goal of unified humanity. He did view the purging of the Thousand Sons as a regrettable act. Regrettable, but needed. To the Emperor, the Space Marines and even most of the Primarchs were nothing more than pieces on a board to be used and discarded if need be. But to the Primarchs, most of them in any regard, the Space Marines were their children, their blood, close advisors and confidants. If Magnus was as old as the Emperor and had seen as many generations of humanity come and go, Magnus would have accepted the Emperor's offer and sacrificed a thousand sons. Magnus would have had regrets, but he would have done so nonetheless. Magnus lacked the Emperor's perspective, but the Emperor lacked empathy entirely. 
Any empathy the Emperor might have possessed had been deadened a long time ago, and to him who had seen a thousand civilizations die, the sacrifice of a thousand sons was very little. The Emperor couldn't see that to Magnus, that sacrifice meant everything. Okay, I'm going to just step in right here. You must bring this Lux Ghost to a close and not talk about it, aren't you? Wow, what happened to you? <laughs> what happened to you? Your glorious first officer informed the weasel of who I was, and she... So, should I comment about the pipe sticking Please out of your- no, and thank you. Isn't that uncomfortable? Yes! Now we will be talking about the origins of the Blood Ravens, or not. <laughs> well, I was gonna let it go, considering. Um, do you need help with that? It's being broadcast now. <laughs> yes. So the entirety of the Imperium knows that I have a pipe in my- I should kill you. <laughs> One or two tugs- no! Now talk about the Blood Ravens! Okay, fine. One of the more mysterious chapters as far as origins go has been the Blood Ravens chapter, a chapter that has held a high percentage of psychers within its legion. Speculation about the chapter has gone back and forth down the line, breaking down color schemes, heraldry, all the way down to their battle tactics and formations. Blood Angels, Raven Guard, Word Bearers, the Thousand Sons were the usual suspects in the discussion. I like the fact that people mistook the Emperor of the Cordillera for the Raven Guard. Amused me. Uh, I'll continue. Whenever a theory was put forward, it'd be debated. Over time, though, more and more hints dropped that the Blood Ravens were a successor chapter of the Thousand Sons. From prophecies about ravens looking for their father, to heraldry, all the way to comments made in books and games. Over time, the amount of hints pointed a finger squarely at the Thousand Sons, all but naming them as the parent liege of the Blood Ravens chapter. In my opinion, the Blood Ravens aren't a successor chapter to the Thousand Sons at all. The Blood Ravens were meant to be the Thousand Sons' replacement. Technically, I can still call them brothers. When the Emperor was making his offer to Magnus, one of the things that Magnus was offered was command of a new legion free of the flesh change. A legion that would share its gene father's proclivity for psychic potential, thirst for knowledge, and in many ways his quest for understanding. In the end, there is one major criticism left of the Blood Ravens as a Thousand Sun's successor chapter, and that's the flesh change. With what the Emperor offered Magnus, as well as all the other hints, references, and almost outright declarations, the matter for me is settled. The Blood Ravens were not ever a successor chapter, but the starting of a legion to replace the damaged and flawed Thousand Sons, with Magnus as its father. Okay, no, no. This conversation will stop now. I, Brother Raziel of the Blood Ravens, will not have my chapter silly any further by this discussion. Speak of the magpies and they will appear. Come, sir, I hope you locked the milk, eh? Right? I went there first, but that is not why I am here. I will not have you publicly shaming my chapter with these vague and inaccurate accusations of a traitor father. Our father's not Magnus the Accursed Red. Really, now? Explain how my reasoning is wrong, then. It's clear that the Emperor was talking about the Grey Knights. Not some fanciful new legion. Every description of the Grey Knights speaks of their intense training and mental fortitude. And how do you know about the Grey Knights exactly? I found a book about it, but that's not important. We are simply not the sons of Magnus, no matter how you slice it. Oh, well then, tell me. Who is your daddy? Son of Magnus is what? What? Remember your father! Oh, my ass! Keep speaking, I will use the Club of Shiza to eliminate you! Where did he get that pipe? Oh my god, how did he get that pipe? This is not a pipe, it is a sacred relic of my chapter, and you will cease your heretical claims against me and my brothers this instant. What'd you call it again? It's the Club of Shiza! A holy relic blessed by the Sisters Hospitaller in their struggle against the foulness of the Thousand Sons, gifted to us so that we may fight on in the Emperor's name. He literally just yanked that out of my ass. He never moved. And he stole my dignity! By the gods, I hate being around you. 
Commissar. I'll have you know that we are not and will never be related to you, foul sorcerer. To say that all the hints and suggestions in your sense of madness are true, plenty of space marines have a high amount of librarians. None as high as yours. Accurate. That's just a coincidence. We're also not the only ones who don't know who their dream father is. Consider it a blessing. Silence, traitor scum. And we are most definitely not the only ones who seek knowledge that can be considered dangerous. We only seek it so that we might understand it. Mm -hmm. Oh, how interesting. Next you're going to tell me that you're also not the only ones who use warp spells to teleport yourself to the site of this lock scout. These can't be the sons of Magnus. It's impossible. And I tire of you insinuating that it is, traitor. I don't get tired. I've been up for six, seven days now? <laughs> and frankly, now that I begin to think about it, it does make a great deal of sense. His legion has a higher than normal quantity of psychers. They seek dangerous knowledge and perhaps a tired, cranky kleptomaniac might be on to something. Armin, she hates that one more than any other. Oh, my Zinch, it's so obvious. What? What do you mean? Yes. Armin? What do you mean? Your father is... Knowledge is power, guard it well. Knowledge is power, guard it well. Knowledge is power, guard it well. Lord God. A little dead bitch said what? What? And now a word from our sponsors. Hello, maggots. I am Armin of the Frozen Sons. Do you tire of blood ravens breaking into your reliquaries and other locked spaces and taking what isn't theirs? Well, Try Hospitaller Runaway. Die, you piece of shit, die! Like you, I spent all my days and nights wondering how I was going to keep the magpies out of the Black Library and away from all my newly acquired books. But then, I discovered that just mentioning Lordon around the Sister of Battle took all my problems away. Back, you demonette! But it's Give me back my rosary! So call now! First seven chapters, get a copy of my latest book, Fuck You, Dad, where I talk about my experiences. Armin, that Blood with... Raven already has a copy of that book in his hand. You bastard! The Webway Project was to be the crowning achievement that would usher in a new golden age of mankind, a symbol of power that would secure humanity's place in the cosmos. It was a centerpiece of the dream that was the Imperium, a symbol that would have brought security and prosperity to every world of humanity. It would have ended the reliance on the warp for humanity, saving its soul in the process. The Golden Throne was meant to be the purest symbol of absolute victory. The Emperor had flaws, several of which I have gone into in great length. There are things that to us would have been obvious that he could simply not see or would not see. Simple emotions and motivations flew over his head. It's said that for the Emperor, every day now is agonizing as he sits on the Golden Throne. It is said the pain is so much that for anyone else, it's simply unbearable. He bears the psychic pain of being held rigid, rotting, for so long in that throne. He bears the psychic pain of constantly waging a ceaseless war against the beings that would flood through the warp gate and overwhelm Terra should he slip for even a moment. But I believe he bears a far greater pain. The greatest symbol of humanity's triumph has become the symbol of its last hope. The icon of an empire that was to be built upon atheistic principles which is now a symbol of religious fanaticism. It is the worst form of insult for the master of mankind to be bound to a throne of gold, twisting in agony, chained only by his willpower to hold closed a door that he himself opened. The Webway Project was to be the Emperor's greatest achievement, but even now the Emperor sits only feet away from the sight of one of his greatest failures. Regret is an emotion that is capable of shredding sanity, dragging a person down into the darkest pits of depression imaginable. I can only imagine that in the 10,000 years the Emperor has sat on the Golden Throne, with his custodians standing their quiet vigil around him, that he has replayed the last time that he spoke with Magnus through his head countless times. In those moments, surrounded by his companion and custodes, but always truly alone, 
I wonder if the Emperor looks back and remembers the moments before and during the Crusade where a kind word or even an attempt at understanding would have moved mountains. I wonder if, as his mind flies to all corners of the galaxy, his consciousness touches that of a grieving father and mother and he begins to finally understand. The Emperor's fate at face value is horrific enough to contemplate, but I wonder if it hasn't been far worse. Trapped. Alone. With only the thoughts of what might have been, and the realization of what he has done. And his only company is silence. Voxcast is finished. Thank you for keeping an eye on him, First Officer. Not to worry, old man. I never thought I'd get this one done. Hmm. Well, now I have other projects to work on. Well, no matter what, Commissar, do try to make some time for fun. Thank you, old man. <laughs>